Greetings, folks, and welcome to Vertisant and FinOps Foundation session, Reducing Cloud Waste at Scale. Here you will learn strategies to drive action and results. Please submit your questions starting now using the Q&A feature on Zoom. Our panelists will respond throughout the session to your questions. If you have elected to receive a copy of JR and Mike Fuller's now famous Cloud FinOps book, your book is on the way. Okay, let's get going here. I'd like to introduce your panelists for today. First off, Melissa Lorden, Lead Program Manager at Vertisant. Then Michael Kern, CEO of Vertisant. And then J.R. Stormont, Executive Director at the FinOps Foundation. Michael, take it away. Thanks, Dean. Um, you know, what we've seen, and you can go to the next slide, please, J.R. Um, one of the things we've seen is that in the early stages of cloud FinOps, really the focus was on understanding what you're spending, where you're spending it, and how it's changing. and and that was surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, hard to do. Um, but now we're moving into a different problem, which is, you know, cloud spend as a proportion of infrastructure spend is increasing rapidly and is becoming the majority of technology infrastructure spend. And that spend's happening at such a scale, and there's so many things to do. You know, people are looking kind of at this long and growing list of things that they need to do to reduce cloud spend. And the real question is. What do you do about it? How do you take action? Um, and you know, I'm sure all of you out there, whether you're kind of working with different organizations on this challenge or you're in an organization trying to tackle this challenge, you know, the, the data is really clear that um, we're moving beyond the problem being visibility and understanding to the problem being the ability to take action. Um, and and as, as JR will talk about, you know, the, the survey that the FinOps Foundation did suggests that some of the top reasons or challenges programs are facing are all around taking action and actually realizing results. And, you know, we've got a list of things here, but I'm sure that a lot of these are probably familiar to most of you. Um, you know, in, in, in the end, it's just, it's, it's hard to get results, right? It's one thing to find you know, you're spending more here or probably you're wasting money there, but but how do you actually turn that into kind of efficient use of cloud spend? And there's, you know, whether it's, you know, teams saying, you know, we're not wasting any money or it's not a priority or, you know, our technology is very complicated, so you don't really understand it or we're already optimized or the numbers aren't correct um, or this will take a lot of work to do. Um, there's certainly a lot of barriers that are being put up and, and what we want to explore today is you know the you know, what approaches can you take to actually overcome these barriers and start to realize value as this becomes more and more important you know as you can see with the public cloud providers um you know aws is i believe now the second largest enterprise software company in the world um and you know gcp and Azure and lots of other answers, they're all growing rapidly. And you know, it, what, was, what was hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue became billions is now tens of billions. Soon will be hundreds of billions for each of these providers, which means right trillions of dollars are gonna be spent in the public cloud. And you know, the stakes get higher and higher. Um, so this idea of how can you overcome these barriers just becomes more and more important. So you know, what we plan to hopefully explore today is some strategies that you can take with you and use um, to help to start to drive results um, and overcome some of these barriers to realize efficient cloud spend in your organizations. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, JR to, to kick us off. Thanks, Mike. I, uh, I love this list. Oh, of course, my video died right when I started there. Fantastic. Let me swap over here while I'm talking and we will get kicked right off. I was just telling these folks right before I was trying out a new camera and hoped nothing went wrong. And of course, it did right when I started talking. So while I'm pulling this up, I, I would say that I, I love this list because it's giving me some flashbacks. There we go. Some flashbacks to what I've heard over the years from people trying to implement this practice. Um, you know, Mike hit on this thing of this big increase in spend and action doesn't really seem to get taken by organizations until there's a threshold that's crossed where spend gets large enough that it really matters, right? Because engineering teams always have competing priorities. We've talked about, they're always focused on you know, delivering features, getting uh, new products and services out. And eventually there's this threshold that gets crossed where it becomes important enough. And we're gonna talk later about organizational prioritization where there starts to be movement on these areas because there's no shortage of data and recommendations and understanding that cost in cloud could be improved. 
It's about how do we, as Mike said, start to move past visibility and start to get to those actions. So that's what we're gonna be focused on uh, today. So background on me by way of introduction, uh, J.R. Stormont. I am the executive director of the FinOps Foundation. Uh, I've spent, uh, well, I guess like almost 22 years now in building web platforms, but the last 12 have really been focused entirely on this area of how do we help get extra value out of the cloud spend, maximize dollars returned. Um, uh, Co-authored a book, yeah, with Mike Fuller from Atlassian. That's a good, a good starting place if you wanna check that out called Cloud FinOps. Uh, but really cut my teeth in this space as co-founder of a company called Cloudability, uh, which was one of the early uh, platforms back in 2011 uh, who helped solve this challenge. Uh, I worked there and working you know, with literally thousands of different companies around the world uh, at different stages of this problem for nine years uh, before that company was acquired by Aptio and worked there for about a year as their uh, GM of cloud. So now my focus is all about how do we help the people who do FinOps uh, advance their practices. I'm, I'm now a full-time employee of the Linux Foundation, so in a, in a vendor neutral, not connected to any platform or consultancy spot, which is really fun because now I get to have these conversations with everybody. So a little bit about the FinOps Foundation. Uh, we're all about the people. So not our customers are not the companies doing this work, it's the actual individual practicing cloud financial management uh, in the industry. We're essentially a trade association that's part of the Linux Foundation. And we focus on community for these individuals doing this, uh, education, career advancement for them, uh, and ultimately defining open source best practices, which I'll talk a little bit at the end here. So what we're gonna talk through today, and uh, for some of those of you who've been part of the FinOps Foundation, you'll recognize some of this data, um, is the state of FinOps report. And the approach we're gonna to take today is I'm gonna highlight some of the data points we got out of this and then pass to Melissa and Michael to share Vertizen's take on uh, these data points and how they've seen action happen in the field. Uh, Vertizen has been a, a really great uh, active member of the foundation and contributing uh, both voice and best practices. So I wanted to get the conversation going uh, around how they see these data points rolling out. Little background on the survey. Uh, we have, uh, this is an open running survey. It's at data.finops.org. Uh, the initial cut of the data was based on the first 800 responses, which represented as a self-reported number from the respondents, about $30 billion of cloud spend. Uh, we had, uh, I think it was over 12 companies uh, participate who spent over a billion dollars a year across different cloud providers. There was a large chunk of hundred plus million dollar spenders, a long tail of 10 to hundred million and a uh, longer group below that. So really large set of spenders and also big companies. The majority of respondents were from companies uh, in the thousand to 10,000 or 10,000 plus range. So let's start with what we consider the most important data points out of the survey, which is what were the top challenges for these organizations once they implemented their practice? And this wasn't about, you know, what are the functions or capabilities or abilities? It was once you actually start the practice, where do you get stuck? And the top challenge, which I don't think uh, is a surprise to anybody who has played here in this space is, okay, I've got visibility potentially into where waste is or where dollars are going or how that's allocated. How do I actually get action taken on those by the engineering teams? Um, so, you know, maybe we'll start as just uh, as we get into this. I'm curious, Melissa, because uh, you've been out there in the field with a lot of folks. Why do you think this is such a hard challenge? Or why do you think it was at the top before we get into the data points? I get the question on a weekly basis, why don't people have more accountability? And there are many reasons that can stem from that. We'll definitely talk about it on a slide in a moment. Um, but as you highlighted, we do need to have the visibility and then we need to move into accountability as well. Um, it's helping people to understand the roles and responsibilities. It's helping them to understand the ramifications of not doing it. It's giving them insight into the bigger picture. Um, but for me, um, with my history across multiple industries, prior to any type of FinOps engagement, it's always helping them um, really to understand why even they aren't taking action. So it's actually much deeper, unfortunately, as an issue. Yeah, that, that why point is always interesting because this is sort of a new part, right, of engineering's work is to start to be a part of this and influence it and actually be able to change the value delivered, right, as a part of not just their features, but the cost and the margins and all these areas. Um, so yeah, totally, totally agree with, with the why aspect. And that's, 
actually one of the things that was one of the respondents I pulled out, it's one of my favorites uh, from the whole survey. We had about 450 write-in answers to this question of how do you get engineers to take action? And I think this really summarizes a lot of what we're gonna talk about, which is this, it's not necessarily an engineering problem, it's really a management commitment problem. Um, and, and this was actually from a, it was from a large company, 10,000 people you know, at the crawl stage, uh, which is a lot of, we're gonna talk about the maturity model here in a minute. It was, I think it was 42% of the respondents. Uh, but I'm curious, Michael, I mean, do you, do you agree with this, with this general sentiment? Do you think this is where it sits in the organization? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that, um, you know, the, the most common thing we see is um, if teams aren't, if it's not an organizational priority, then it's not going to be a priority for teams, especially, you know, if you think about the shift, the shift has been from, you know, infrastructure used to be really difficult to procure and kind of happened kind of very separate from the engineering practices and the engineers themselves didn't have a lot of control. Now infrastructure is procured in the act of engineering on demand. And so, you know, this idea of, you know, they now have the ability to kind of, they govern a lot of the, or they create a lot of the spend now, but the prioritization of them have, having engineers look at spend hasn't shifted. And so, you know, what we see over and over and over again is, you know, engineering teams are as they should be, you know, asked to deliver product, keep service level quality high, you know, increase throughput, increase speed. You know, there's all of these things that they've always been asked to do that are a priority. And then now there's this other little thing, which is, you know, holy cow, we're spending a ton on cloud, do something about it. But you know the, the fundamental kind of processes and prioritization mechanisms haven't changed, even though you know the the control of spend and the influence of spend has shifted clearly to engineering teams. But kind of org org prioritization hasn't changed with it. Yeah, I love what you said. There's this new little thing called cost, right? That you have to pull in, and I, it feels like in your initial slide about the pushback kind of hits this that you know it it kind of comes down to well something's got to give, right? Yeah, do we do we give on cost? Do we give on security? Do we give on feature velocity, what, what, it, what is that thing, right? And that shift of power has been really interesting. And that's, you know, power meaning spending now moves over to engineers who can procure resources, which we have to get that pushback. Well, that's, that's, that's a good thing, right? Yes, we want them to move faster. We want them to deliver things, be able to get access to unlimited resources, but we also need financial accountability, right? Which is really the crux of that problem. And they need guidance, right, from the top as to where to put that focus. So this is kind of where we see uh, typically people start, and this will probably look familiar for some of you who are in it or are starting or even further down the road. There are answers like this from the survey that were like, how do you get engineers to take action? We don't know, right? We, we don't have a good answer. We've, we've tried a bunch of stuff, it didn't really work. Uh, we're trying to figure out uh, where the responsibility sits, like in a RACI model, uh, you know, trying to define that between teams. Um, Generally, as I think we're going to dig into, and this often does fall down to uh, ownership and prioritization of the process. So as we start to look at the data, we're going to cut it across these three dimensions. So in the, the FinOps practice, we often talk about, you know, what great looks like, which is that run stage. But just as often people want to know, you know, where do I get started and what are the initial pitfalls? And that's really the crawl stage. When we did this survey, uh, we asked people to self-rate themselves. Uh, and so what we've been doing is splitting up the data across what each organization or each individual who was practicing this at the organization uh, self-measured themselves as. Um, so we're gonna look at each of these as we go through it. Um, and if you look at data.finops.org, if you wanna follow along at home, we're pulling some of this from here. Uh, but I, I'm curious, Melissa, what's, what's your take? I'm gonna flip the tile here on crawl. What do you think the, the top challenge at the crawl stage is gonna be? It is that first step for visibility. In most instances, you're starting to get a little bit of data in place. But then, as as you all highlight um, in your FinOps lifecycle, um, we've got the visibility um, where we're informing, we're optimizing, and we're operating. So each one of those pieces can definitely be in the nascent state. Um, but definitely, the first first piece is getting visibility and awareness. Yeah, I, I think I think that's spot on. Interestingly, the challenge that was highlighted, I, I kind of probably should have set this up better, was was the actual, you know, once we get visibility in those things, we, we're still struggling to get engineering action, right? And we're struggling with shared costs. We're struggling with forecasting once we get these things because the visibility aspect is sort of the given first step. And then where do people get stuck? And what we saw at that crawl stage was essentially this three-part bit, which is people are very reactive. 
right? You, they get that visibility. They start to see where things are. They start to educate teams about the importance of this. They start to communicate it out, but it feels like they're sort of, um, what's the expression, pushing water uphill. I mean, they're, they're just sort of constant reminders, constant requests to the teams. Um, you know, the things that came out in this were, we are basically doing regular workshops. We are getting together on one-on-ones. We're doing road shows. We're trying to name shames. Uh, there's a lot of education happening. Uh, but the theme we hear, you know, a lot is just people are sort of banging their heads against the wall at this stage because they're just, you know, pushing, pushing, pushing on it. So, um, you know, what we, we worked through this before with the Burson team, you know, they came out with some best practice kind of takeaways on this. And yeah, to that point, establishing visibility and accountability. So like, Melissa, when you're at that stage, where, where do you see yourself, where, where do you like recommend clients start with getting that visibility and accountability going? Apologize for that. Unmuting. So in, in many instances, you talk about it, for example, with the FinOps lifecycle, we need to inform, we need to optimize, we need to operate. Um, also in the FinOps, just cloud financial principles, um, we need to look for that empowerment, the visibility, the targets and the tracking. Even, even going back to ProSci 25 years ago, it's the first thing in, in every avenue, we need to build awareness. Um, the ADCAR model from ProSci is the A for awareness and it is the number one problem in change. So we know visibility is key. We seek to give visibility into the problem. Um, one of my favorite clients likens visibility into shining a flashlight on a rat. And the more we can understand about that rat, then is how we can start to empower our teams. How big is the rat? How many are there? Where are they? Where is the biggest problem? Where is it coming from in the first place? Yeah. So once we actually do get that light on the rat and we give our teams the data and more data and more insights, and there are so many vendors coming into this space, right? It's, it's a really exciting time in the space. So why aren't we taking action? Um, and then this, it, it really comes back then to your top problem there, as far as how are we getting people to be accountable for realizing those results. If we look at the Cloud Center of Excellence recommendations um, across Amazon, Google, Microsoft, all of them are talking about having these teams take accountability for the cost. And as you already said, your FinOps report cites taking action. So to your point with all of these bullet points here, the, the typical ways that we look at overcoming some of those hurdles are defining strategy, quantifying the goals, getting the races in place, making sure that we have all of the resources available. We talk about incentives, but unfortunately in my experience, we can put all of these things into place. And at the end of the day, when, when we say, why isn't JR taking accountability? <laughs> why isn't he doing his job? Why isn't he following through? One of the hardest things when I coach folks on change management is taking that step back as a leader or as somebody who is asking these teams to take action and what else can I do myself as well? What other tools can I give them? Um, what other practices can we put in place? And frankly, this when I say why, it's also actually getting into the five whys of, mm. am I even creating them a, a safe environment for them? And as fluffy as that sounds, I'm not actually a people person, but it's really important to take that pause to make sure that your team feels like as this data is coming into place, they aren't in trouble. This is an evolution and change for all of the teams together. Um, so making that safe environment and working together on it is right. really key. So it's definitely. even deeper than that, unfortunately, than I can make you the most beautiful racy in the world. <laughs> it, it doesn't, it, it won't necessarily spur action. I, I was initially going to push back on you that whole shine the light on the rat thing, because that's, it's often, I think the sentiment, which is you've messed up, you've deployed your yep. infrastructure inefficiently. But yeah. then where you end up was like, you know, how do we help, you know, do uh, sort of accountability and make, help yeah. them out, enable them. And, and I, I was just actually reading um, 
working with, with Google on aligning some of the Google cloud, cloud best practices. And, and they've got this cultural pillar that they talk about, which I love, which I think is aligned with what you're saying, which is a, a blameless culture, right? Sure. We're, we're gonna highlight these things. We're gonna help uh, people figure out where they could do better, but, but nobody's at fault, right? The five whys yep. are not about who messed up. It's about how can we improve this next time? Yep. Uh, and, that, and that dovetails actually really nicely into the question I was gonna pose to you, Michael, which is this concept that uh, you all have talked about uh, of being a partner not an auditor. And I, I remember our, one of our first Finance Foundation member calls back in early 2019, uh, Jason Fuller, who was one of our early members, had said, you got, you got to come to, to engineers with kid gloves, right? You, you can't come in like saying, you know, we're a finance team and we're going to tell you how to run your infrastructure. So, you know, how, how do you see that partner, not auditor theme play out? Right? Yeah, I, you know, for us, it's interesting. Um, you know, our genesis was, you know, we, we, we've come out of one of the world's largest private software companies and, and you know, our, the, the product we have, we actually built ourselves for our own use. And because, you know, we have been working in the cloud since 2006, we had hundreds of products and billions of lines of code and tons of spend, and, and we were struggling to, to get control of it. So we actually developed technology to do it ourselves, right? And it was engineers actually built it because, you know, the onus was put on them to figure out, okay, our spend is increasing exponentially you need to figure out a way um, to, to control it. So actually this was an engineering driven solution, you know, so built by engineers for engineers. Um, what was interesting is, you know, when we started to work with companies outside of ourselves, we were so excited with how much kind of cloud waste we found. I mean, we kind of almost led with, look at all the money you're wasting. And, you know, we were all excited, but what we realized was that kind of caused everyone to put up, right? It, it's, when you said, we didn't use those exact words, but we, we essentially kind of came with that message. And you know what we found was you're automatically, whether you intend to or not, it, it's, it's positioned as blame. And what we found is that mm. um, really, like when we thought about why did we build this for ourselves in the first place, it was really, you know, the messaging was, look, you, know, you now have control of this stuff, which is great because you have the flexibility to get the infrastructure you want, you know, to do the right thing for your product and your business. And that's great. Um, but with that comes some responsibilities around controlling costs. We built something to help you do that. So you don't need an auditor. You don't need someone telling you what to do. And oh, by the way, so that you can do, you know, the less you waste, the more you can do with your spend. Right, so we're actually helping you and enabling you. And, and there's a question um, in, in the, the, the question list, which was, you know, FinOps feels like a finance or corporate driven initiative. How have you, successful organizations shifted this perception and how'd they do it? You know, in our experience, including for ourselves, um, you know, we found that making it, you know, essentially making it an engineering driven organization where if there's a central FinOps group or a finance group, they're supporting, they're enabling, they're not kind of controlling or dictating. And for us, it's that, that simple thing. And, and there's a bunch of other kind of best practices we see around, you know, it's one thing to kind of say, okay, engineering, we trust you to do it, but it's another to give them the tools to do it successfully and easily. But, but what we've found kind of the best way to shift um, perception is to move from audit to enable, move from, you know, we're telling you what to do or we're watching you or we're policing you to, you know, we're your partner in this. Um, we want you to have control. We want you to get the most out of the cloud and we're gonna give you these tools to do so responsibly is, is what we've seen in terms of shifting the perception. So One of the, the funny themes that came out of the, the survey data was that the, the FinOps team doesn't actually do FinOps. That they're just, as you said, enabling other teams to do those things, right? Engineering teams, product teams, development teams. They, they have some centralized functions, right? They're going to be managing spin commitments and savings plans or reserve instances. But for the most part, they're, they're pushing out ownership and enablement and evangelism and helping people to understand the why. There's a lot of like, you know, education and training around that as well. Um, yeah. The, and the other piece I'd add too is the more that you can have peers speak with each other, we always have early adopters with any technology or, or any concept. So if you can find those people that can see the enthusiasm that when you start to talk about this concept and, and they realize how much waste is there, 
that their eyes light up and they're excited for this as a challenge. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more later about engineers and they are problem solvers. So for some people, this really resonates that once you get that visibility in there and, and you can start the momentum with peers talking to peers. And so it's not finance coming yeah. at them, but it's, it's a problem we can solve and we can do better for our company. A lot of the run stage people I've seen have really strong internal, you know, cost op or fin ops or CFM blogs that they run where yeah, engineers will publish their wins and talk about how they found a staging environment that was running or they, you know, re-architected to a different, you know, service or any of those things. That's the best way. Um, there was also a question that came in uh, about for those starting out, who's usually the first person in an organization to evangelize fin ops and cost optimization as engineering, as finance, as operations. Um, from my experience, I've seen it be a mix of all. Um, Riley Jenkins from Domo, who's leading this working group that we have right now on, on engineering action. He's an engineer. He started his organization, but he started kind of stealthily and went to other engineers because he was passionate about it. That's probably in the minority. It's usually more often somebody, you know, finance uh, operations or top level is saying, hey, we need to fix this. Go talk to the people, right, to get it going. But I, I would say that the former model, uh, which is starting engineering, I've seen work the best. Uh, what do you think, Melissa? Have you seen similar or where do you normally see it start? Definitely in, in all realms. And again, trying to ride that enthusiasm where we can, um, because it is, it, it makes the curve um, more attainable versus um, we do often also try to get the biggest wins where we see the most investment, but they may not be ready for that change mm -hmm. yet. So, so it, it, while we can certainly approach it from that avenue, it will take more effort. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting too. You said they may not be ready, assuming meaning that team or that individual, because this, mm -hmm. this whole maturity thing is, it's not really tied to the company, right? And that's why we talk about FinOps being about building a muscle in the organization, because each team may be a different stage, and then each business unit may be, and then as each new products roll out. So it's really about, I think, getting everybody up to the same level over time. So jumping back into the data here, um, second challenge for, or in the, sorry, walk stage was all the top challenge was also getting engineers to take action. So no, no surprise there. And the things that this group highlighted in their responses were really, they start to be in the walk stage more proactive about this work. They're not going out there just sending notifications after the fact saying, you know, hey, can you check this out? Look at this recommendation. They start to gamify. Uh, they start to highlight wins, start to do scorecards to track not only efficiency, but things like how well is each team doing against their budget? And how does that variance look like? Uh, and they start to put in better processes and KPIs to monitor this in more of a metrics driven way than a you know, cadence based. We look at this once a week, once a month, once a quarter and try and, try and fix things. So question um, for you, know, you, Melissa, around this, you know, there's this concept that came out in, in this sort of previous uh, idea of uh, getting the you know cost recommendations, getting individual bits out to the engineers is where they're working, which I think kind of speaks to the theme of making it easy. How, how do you how do you start to do that, or, or what what are the key you know first steps you do in organizations to get that data in front of the engineers? Absolutely. So within all of the cloud providers, they do have their data, they have their consoles, and people can go out and fish for it. As I said, there are more and more companies coming in that can shine that light on the rat, but really the next phase is then what are the tools that we can enable them with to be the rat catcher <laughs> and to actually get to the root cause. Um, so, so the more elements that we can add as far as workflow, so even beyond processes, right? How can we implement workflow? Why do we go to Amazon, right? Because it's all right there beyond the free shipping, right? And, and not speaking about AWS, but beyond the free shipping, everything is at our fingertips. So even if I want to support a small company, for example, Amazon's just easy. So, so the more parallels we can make that and, and not only give visibility to the engineers, but also enable them with the tools, whether it's standards and deployment, um, creating that, that basic foundation that can mitigate those impediments that we talked about at the beginning, that the data isn't right, or um, we don't have the support, making sure that it's coming at them from all angles um, so they can catch the rat. Awesome. And Michael, the theme also we highlighted previously was giving engineering teams control. How do you see that actually play out? Well, I think that, you know, 
the reality of of um, you know, some of the pushback is a lot of it is based in, in, in truth or fact. I think one of the things to think about is you know, engineers and engineering teams do have a lot of priorities, but also what they're working on is, is really complex. And, you know, j just because from a finance or just from a FinOps perspective, you think money's being wasted or that something should be done, th there's actually multiple layers, service level, architectural decisions, you know, different things that matter. And so, you know, what we found is if you give them, if you make it easy, if you give them the information, but also give them control. So control to decide what kinds of things they should look at, what kind of service level should they commit to, what kind of tolerances, correct? Cause you're looking at different things like what is efficient. Um, that varies based on the technology, the use case, the business criticality. There's a lot of variables and you know, rather than kind of having generic principles that then engineering teams have to tell you why in their circumstance, these things don't make sense. It's just give them the data, allow them to tune it, and then allow them to take the appropriate action. Mm -hmm. um, we find, you know, it, 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 it not only makes it easy, but it, it gives them control and it makes it more likely for them rather than viewed as just like someone who doesn't understand, you know, putting a burden on me. It's, I have a bunch of data. I understand that this is important and I have the control to kind of determine which things I take action on and which things I don't mm -hmm. and, and I control it. So I'm not being told what to do we find is, is, is incredibly powerful. And so there was a question that came in that's relevant to this about how this often starts in the CTO function. And that's generally who's, you know, they're prescribing which and how to use cloud technologies. And they've typically seen uh, that group, the CTO function lead the push to FinOps. And the question is, is that a good logical starting point? And I, I think to, to Michael's point there, it's, it's, we, we do see that work really well because we, we want the engineering teams and the technology function to feel in control of it. It is not some external group pushing it. And so in the state of FinOps data that we found um, was that the majority of the time this function did live under either CIO or CTO, right? Depending on the organization. And only in smaller cases did it live under a CFO or a COO or, or someone like that. Um, and I think part of that is not just uh, understanding the technology, but uh, those groups have the most ability to impact change, right? To drive engineering um, priorities. But, and that actually kind of gets to the second question we'd like to, to pose to either one of you. Another question that came in, which is, do you think that this function will eventually be absorbed by other, the FinOps function will it be absorbed by other departments? Would it go to COO? Would it go to CFO? Where, where do you think it should ultimately live in a, in a highly mature cloud organization? You know, it, it's interesting because I think that um, in my view, it, I think it belongs with, with the engineering teams, but, but right, obviously the CFO organization controls budgets and controls spend. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if I was to design it, I would say that, you know, through a normal process, the, the engineering orgs Right, they 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 out a budget is allocated based on need, and then there's you know and and the the responsibility of driving efficient cloud spend based on that budget is within the CTO organization. But obviously, just like everything else in in a, in a in a company, especially a large company, it's multidisciplinary. Where you set the budget, you know maybe a cross disciplinary group, kind of that's matrixed. Um, yeah, you know, it's like that as well. provides tooling, but at the end of the day, it's the engineering orgs that that own the responsibility to meet the the, the needs of the budget. Um, so I, I think, you know, a multidisciplinary team, but kind of ownership within engineering or the CTO CIO suite is is the best way. That's where we've seen the most the most effectiveness. And and at this yeah. point, you also hear every company is a technology company at this point. Right, and, and so to that end, again, having the heartbeat there in the engineering and helping them to understand their accountability because it, it is a cost now, it impacts margins directly from their decisions. That, that's a theme that we actually brought up in our member call on this topic, which was quoted from the state of DevOps report that Puppet put out, which is that basically now in a world where everybody's a technology company, the rest of the business all needs to align around how can they support the technology wing to deliver better and faster because that's really the differentiation around better features. Alaska Airlines C CIO said, we're, a, we're not an airline, we're a data company with wings, right? So yeah. how, how does all the supporting business functions make sure that's the way to go? 
So Michael, we had this theme of uh, make them aware, even though we're enabling them and we're being their partners and accountability uh, around cost, we still need to show them the cost of inaction, which is, is a challenging one. How, how do you walk that line between policing and enabling and getting them aware of these things? Well, I think my, my personal favorite model is positioning it as you, you've got a certain amount of money to drive outcomes. The more efficient you are with that money, the more you can do. The less efficient you are with that money, the less you can do. And, and the enablement basically moves to giving them that data and saying, you know, look, you've got X dollars and right in this pocket, you are inefficient and here's what we see. Um, you know, you can, you've only got X dollars. So if you, if, if you can make this more efficient, you, you can do more with it. But if you don't, that means, you know, this other thing that you want to spend money on, you can't because there's no, there's no budget allocated. So I think that just, you know, again, it's kind of like, you know, I think a lot of psychology or change management, which is, you know, if you, rather than tell someone to do something or tell them they're going to get in trouble if they don't do it, it's, it's make them aware of like, they have a choice. Um, make them aware of, of the, the ramifications of different choices and give them all the data they would need to make a good decision and then trust them to make a good decision. Um, and if they don't, you know, obviously remind them that, well, look, you don't have extra money for this thing because, you know, you have a fixed budget. If you want to free up money, these are the places to do it. You've chosen not to to this point, and that's okay. But, you know, if you want more money, operate more efficiently. And so, you know, I think that... Um, in our experience, is is a lot of the 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 a lot of the, the the effectiveness around kind of getting people to change behavior is around making them understand their choices and the costs. Um, there's a famous study, you know, where they tried in a hospital, just kind of these really stern like wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, and then separately, basically signs that just said that, you know you put patients are put at risk when you don't wash your hands, right? So one is just do this thing because you have to. The other is you should wash your hands, but these are the, these are the costs of not. And what people find over and over and over again is, is, is people respond better to a choice with a clear understanding of the costs of one action over another versus just being told what to do. Um, and so I think that enabling them, but also letting them see the back end of that is the best way, way to, to drive the change you want. And a good good segue, Melissa. I think into your next point on how to celebrate those wins and motivate the teams with it. You bet. So you also mentioned gamification before, and I, as a person, I'm I'm not a fun person, so I don't like games. So so when this concept of gamification was was originally introduced, I don't I don't have time for that. Just buckle down, do your work, be a good corporate citizen. Um, if, if you think about in life with change and, and change is inevitable, change is a theme here, whether it's, it's DevOps, we're, we're moving into the challenges of FinOps. When we look at change in life, if you step back, change can be enjoyable. Do you fight change if you actually like the change, whether it's a pay raise or it's a, a difference in location or, or anything else? We fight change when it's not enjoyable or we are afraid or or we don't understand what's happening. Um, so again, putting all those pieces that we've already talked about as far as enablement, um, a lot of times when folks think about gamification, they may think about badges and that's where I just, it, it doesn't interest me. It interests a bunch of people, so so let's let's play into that. Or incenting people as well. The most important piece is really understanding your audience and what resonates with them. And it, and depending on the size of your organization, you may have to come at it from multiple directions. Underlying the the biggest problem with a badge or an incentive is that it's an in extrinsic motivation, not an intrinsic motivator, meaning they don't build that sense of accountability that we've been talking about that we're, we're trying to aim for. And so they've got short-term wins without the longer picture in mind. Um, so with the engineers in particular, we like to focus on those intrinsic strategies and really play into their strengths. Um, doing it because it's enjoyable, doing it because they do love to solve problems. They don't need that reward. They like the creativity. They like to work with their peers. Um, and so rolling along those, um, 
we look at social influence and relatedness as far as creating visibility with what peers are doing. Um, certainly you can do a collaboration across teams or against teams, um, but really helps to understand where you are along with your peers so you can do the challenge there. Um, is it an epic quest? Um, how are we helping the company and, and playing on all these themes of um, intrinsic motivators and how can we get that mastery and understand the problem and solve it? There's actually, um, JR, just I, it, one, uh, two questions related, one of which is directed to you. So I thought that might be a good time. So when companies deployed cloud ability, how long did it take companies to adopt the practice of cloud efficiency saving? And then there's kind of a, a corollary question, which is from start to finish, when organizations start doing FinOps, how long does it take to see to see behavior change? So I think they're kind of related. So do you have a thought on that? Yeah, and I'll, I'll speak more in, in broad platform terms since I'm, I'm no longer at CloudAbility, but I, I think the, and both those are probably less about technology and more about the practice and how long that takes to get in place. Um, first level set thing on that, because the question says, cloud efficiency or savings is that this practice really isn't about savings, right? It is about this enabling of teams to make better decisions with the right data, with the accountability. The decision may be to spend more sometimes, right? Um, it may be that we need to double down in this part of the infrastructure on just bigger boxes or a more, you know, easier to deploy managed service because we got to get this thing out. But the, the idea here is that um, time frame on this, you're never really done, right? We, we talk about the fin up cycle, it's inform, optimize, operate. You're continuously going through that. What you're trying to optimize on is not getting to the end. It's about how do you get teams to go through the cycle faster, see what's happening in the infrastructure, make new goals about how to adjust it, put those goals in place in the operate phase, you know, continue round and round and round. Because even for the most mature, I mean, Mike Fuller, co-author on the book, uh, he's been doing this at Atlassian for eight years. Atlassian, uh, you know, he, he can't say, and I, I can't say, but their, their spending is unbelievably huge in cloud for the size of company they are. Uh, they're experts in this space. He's done nothing but this for eight years. And yet he's constantly going back to crawl stage because uh, I remember a couple of years ago, AWS went to per second level billing for EC2 and that blew everything up. You know, and then they changed from RIs to savings plans or then you add a new cloud provider. So this is really about how can we get, uh, as I said earlier, the muscle built in the organization um, to get to that crawl to walk stage, which is probably where, you know, a lot of people are trying to get to small company, you know, they may do it in, in six months, big company may take honestly years. I've seen, you know, fortune tens who've been at this for three, four years, and they're just getting to walk stage. Um, you know, in terms of the, where the behavior change, you know, happens start to finish. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of want to turn that back to, to you all. I mean, what, Melissa, you were talking about this aspect of, you know, the, um, intrinsic motivations, right? Which is, which is so different in, in this, the last member call we had, uh, Comcast was showing this um, gamification they had done, which was uh, a capture the flag where they, they posted really hard cost optimization challenges, no incentives. And it turned out that the people, or rather the challenges that were picked up the most were the really hard ones. People mm -hmm. wanted those epic challenges they go after, mm -hmm. right? So I think what you were saying earlier was spot on on that. Yeah, definitely. So, so again, it's knowing your audience, it's meeting them where they are and building those challenges. And it's, it's definitely, you can do a lot of tests to see what does resonate with your groups as well. Um, we have some organizations where competition against or visibility against other folks is not advisable. Um, and so then it's, it's also though, uh, going to, to a different medical study um, where they had cameras where people were washing their hands. Even though people knew cameras were there, they still didn't wash their hands. But when they saw results of their, um, their hours of, of staffing against others, suddenly it's super spiked. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is testing and understanding in iterations how you can get those wins, how you can motivate. And, and celebrating as well, making sure you're highlighting. Um, there are other pieces where you can look at where do you stand as an individual or as a team against others, and those could totally be anonymous. But even just while I I said I don't like games, I'm competitive. If I see <laughs> right, if I if I see I'm at the bottom, I'm definitely going to get to average. And if I'm at average, I want to to be the best. And and even once I'm the best, I want to continually optimize. So it still goes back and 
to that circle. Yeah, incentives um, have to be monetary, right? I've seen that a lot of engineers I work with just want to be the best at what they do, right? They yep. want to be the principal mm -hmm. engineer. And, and, so. and really tap into that, right? As Michael talked about, make this an engineering focus, not a finance focus. Tap into those strengths yep. um, and acknowledge those and, and showcase those. Again, whether it's through blogs or different change management um, cycles, whether it's newsletters. Totally, which gets us to the third stage. And I, I moved us forward because I just saw Dean's note about leaving 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. But um, the, the, the run stage, uh, notably top challenge, again, getting engineers to take action, still hard, it turns out. Uh, but the way people were starting to do it at this stage was with an integrated approach. Instead of being reactive in the crawl stage or just starting to push things out proactively in the walk stage, they start to do the organizational and executive alignment, which is really key on this. Uh, they get automation in place where possible, which I'm going to raise another data point here toward the end on this as well. Um, and they start to get sort of this theme of the, the data in, or the insights or the recommendations in the path of the engineer, right? Moving to this stuff ends up automatically in the backlog in JIRA, right? And it ends up as something that can be prioritized in the sprints when those conversations happen. Ideally, there are, we've already got enablement and empowerment of the teams. We're starting now to enable this process where, as one person highlighted in that second bullet, this is part of not only a review later, but part of the design process. If we did design the infrastructure in this way, what will the cost impact be? And, and presenting different options before it's even built. We could go this way, it'll cost this much, it'll take this much time. Go this way, it might cost more, but we can deploy faster, et cetera, et cetera. So the theme that we wanted to pull out on this was really organizational priority. And this is one, honestly, I, I feel like I can't always come out with a great answer. Because people say, you got to make it a priority. So like, Melissa, how have you seen organizations really do that other than lip service? It, it does have to be mirrored by actions. It does have to be mirrored by understanding your organization and, and what does resonate. So we do hear time and time again, this isn't our priority. Our leadership hasn't made it a priority. And, and yet throughout software, we see it is the number one priority, but we're constantly throwing distractions at them. So all of those actions have to be consistently aligned because it's it's just like training a dog. You give them one, one little distraction and they're going to understand that it isn't the priority, whether, whether that's conscious or subconscious. So iterate, 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 broken record um, and, and demonstrate with those KPIs with everything else that we're trying to align to. And so this is completely motherhood and apple pie statement. We know it has to be priority, but it has to be recursive. It has to be constant to shine that light on the rat and get them out of there. Absolutely, which gets us to our next point on measurements and controls and, and where do we start and you know both what great looks like and how do we track that? You know, Michael, how, how do you see this one play out? Well, and, and for us, this, this is actually, this actually means you know, one of, one of the things we hear the most, especially in more complex environments is that the, the, the recommendations don't take into account the complexity of the technology at the organization. We can't do or, that because our, our app is too complex. It'll, yeah. yeah, or like we can't afford, like we can't afford any latency. We can't afford any downtime. We can't afford like all these things, which are absolutely 100% true. Um, so one of the things we find is, okay, that's great, but let's, let's define what those things are and let's measure, like both measure, do, is anything we're doing having impacts negatively, um, but also um, put in controls to say like, look, these are the guardrails. So in these kinds of environments or for these products, these are the things that you can't touch or these are the abs must and musts and absolutes. Um, and, and kind of define those because sometimes what you find is you know, there's there's this idea that oh, we need all of this extra headroom because, um, and you're like, well, wait a minute. So what are you actually? What 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 is the thing you actually need to deliver? It's we need these these SLAs or we need this amount of service quality or this kind of performance. It's like okay, those are two. Those are the extra headroom is an idea or a possible answer to that, um, and and that may or may not make sense. But if if you know if, if you start if if the cost of that assumption starts to be millions of dollars you should test that assumption and challenge that assumption, but also not ignore what you're trying to resolve. So, you know, one of the things we've always found is you know, it's really important to apply context. And a lot of times context is both kind of measuring what, what's important, not just from a cost perspective, but from a kind of product perspective. 
but also putting in controls to make sure that, you know, if there are hard boundaries, like everything you're doing takes those boundaries into account. And those boundaries vary by product, by environment, by all these things. This is that enabling decision making. And the, we talk about this idea of the iron triangle where it's you want a good, fast, or cheap, right? And it's it's not the same for the whole company. It's it should vary by product. That's right. Cheap, and by environment. That's right. Um, and and you don't want people to have to kind of defend the same point over and over and over again. because mm-hmm. um, that gets exhausting quickly and, and you, I think you lose people. There was an interesting point, I think, uh, just came in as well that was less of a question, but I think it's worth making, which is Somebody saying when they work with clients on this uh, in the crawl phase, they recommend a C-level announcement as a prerequisite to clearly indicate to the whole organization this has full management backing. I yeah, couldn't agree more. I remember working with a bunch of folks in this area where FinOps team or whatever they're called there wanted to put out this and you invariably always counsel, you know, yeah, go to the VP, right? Have them send out the announcement, the CTO to get that process started. Yeah, it's a lonely journey to ask you know, a FinOps team, multidisciplinary from a single group, whatever. It's a lonely journey to ask them to try to push this from the bottom up with no top-down support. It is a lonely, hard journey. There are probably some people on, on this on this call, they, they've probably been through that journey and it, it's a hard one and a lonely one. And, and even with that, this is where we need to reiterate time and time again. It's not even just that first announcement, which is absolutely crucial but mirroring those actions that we don't lose sight of it. I think the key thing there too is that first announcement is, is the crawl phase, right? It's not, sure. you don't have a practice yeah. build at that point. You're just starting to gain momentum. It's that first Absolutely. Show. Yeah, great point. So let's talk a little bit about automation, discovery and resolution, all those areas. Um, this is always the thing that actually, maybe I'll do this in slightly reverse order. Uh, which is the, the data that we pulled from uh, the survey actually showed that the majority of these companies, even the run stagers, for the most part, weren't automating much, right? Um, 70% of the walk stagers had no automation. Um, and those who were automating, uh, they weren't really automating, uh, I'd say things with a lot of teeth, right? They're automating tag hygiene, they're automating recommendations and notifications, but infrastructure changes were a very small percentage um, you know, of those who are actually doing it. So, you know, jumping back to the point for the two of you of automating this, you know, how, how do you overcome those blockers and, and how do you, how do you make automation a reality? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you from our own kind of our own experience, which kind of led to, to our thinking, which was, you know, we, we were looking at, you know, hundreds of products, billions of lines of code, you know, tens of thousands of AWS accounts and trying to figure out, you know, how do you, how, how can you, meaningfully understand everything that needs to be done and take action. And, you know, one of the things is, you know, a thousand dollar opportunity, um, you know, may or may not be worth pursuing if you have to have a person research it and do all of these things, right? Um, but a thousand, thousand dollar opportunities, and, and Jared, check my math, but I think that's a million dollars. Um, so, so, right, that's, that's a different scale. And what we found is we, we, we had 10,000 thousand dollar opportunities plus big ones and, and all sorts of other things. And so when we looked at that, we said, well, you can't, you know, millions of dollars is a lot of money, but you can't have someone research all of those and you can't have someone take action on all of those. So what do you do? And so what we found is you've got to, if you want to really operate at scale, there's no way humanly possible that would be cost effective to, to make sense of this. So, you know, our, our view is two things. One, you know, automate as much of the process as possible, right? So you don't need a human. You have kind of automation, finding these things, figuring out what needs to be done and then actually taking action. So that's part one. And then part two is, and, and someone had asked the question, you know, how do you see this space evolving in the next five years? Um, and, and, and this is part of my answer to that question, which is the other part of it is, you know, Integra- meet, meet the developers and, and engineers as close to where they normally operate as possible, right? So don't make them, so automate as much as possible so they have all the information they need to make a decision and then let, make the action quick, which is automate it. Um, but also don't make them hunt and find and leave their normal processes to, to, to figure this stuff out. So, you know, what we see is, you know, automate the steps, but also keep it within the kind of the process that the engineers work in every day. Um, and that's really like, if you want to drive, if you want to drive change, 
give people visibility, give people the information to make good decisions and, and, and make them aware of the consequences of whatever decisions they make, but then also make it easy and close to how they normally work. I think if you do those two things, um, you know, we've seen that you actually get the results you want because people, you know, people when given the right information, more often than not will make, given the right information and, 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 and making good decisions easy to make, more often than not, they'll make the right decision and do with, the, with right the right thing. prioritization framework, especially. Yeah. And so those are the things that we see um, that really, like, if, if you want to do this at scale, frankly, there's no other way. Um, you know, there's big things you can do, like discounting and savings plan, like all of that, like the macro stuff, like, right, you can do at scale with people. But, you know, if you want to actually really drive things across a program in a large complex environment like without automation, it, I mean, it, it's physically impossible and probably not cost effective. This is one of the challenges to see also with these practices when they get to the run stage is that, you know, in the crawl walk, it, it's like you're, 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 you know, accelerating around a racetrack. It's, you know, the first quarter mile, you're, you're going faster, 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 and your crawl stage, you're knocking off easy wins and you get around the next side and you're still going fast and accelerating. You're not, you know, less easy wins, but as you start looping around the track, you know, you're, you're going quickly, you're making progress, but you're not getting these giant wins because you've taken down the low hanging fruit. At the same time, you got to do that thing of like, you know, you said, Michael, when we talked earlier, dollars made of pennies, I think it was death by a thousand paper cuts. Ideally, you're automating that, that hygiene, that ongoing process, because just because you're at full speed and not seeing big wins, if you take your foot off the gas, right, you're going to see that you're going to slow down. You're going to see those waste bits come in. Um, Melissa, I'm curious your thought on this other question as well, which is, that Michael answered there. How, how do you see the space evolving in the next five years? And so just queuing off of the automation piece as well, when we talk about the people complexities and the problems, automation also largely addresses that. And so the more we can automate, the more we can shift that creativity and those resources to solving our next problems. Yep. Um, and so we've got the cost under control. We've got visibility into them. We are maintaining them. We are running with them and letting people go on to the next adventure. Maybe that's kind of an answer to where this goes, right? Which is this, yep. it's no longer a, a separate thing or process you need to build. It becomes just part of the culture. Yes, it absolutely. It's just part of how we manage technology, not it is. Out differently. And it's just part of how you build product, right? Just like kind of DevOps practices and CI, CD, like all of these things took stuff that was fundamentally separate and integrated it into the engineering process. This is the same thing. Um, I, you know, we, we, we firmly believe that the path, the best way to move this forward and where the, the, where the space will go is this is just another part, integrated part of a product engineering process or yep. software engineering process. Um, I totally agree, totally agree. Um, so I know we're, we're getting short in time here. Um, you know, those who want to follow along with this, we're launching more of this data at finops.org on April 8th. Uh, some of this playbook and additional framework information. Uh, and definitely want to leave a few minutes for Michael and Melissa to do their outro and answer any of the questions that we might want to cover. Um, no, other than, you know, I think we you know, our contact information will be out there. So, you know, if you have, if there are questions we didn't answer, you'd love to learn more about us or just kind of connect with us, um, feel free to reach out to myself. Or, or Melissa, and we're happy to, to continue the conversation, answer any questions you have, or, or kind of trade stories. So please reach out to us, LinkedIn, email, um, whatever's easiest. And, and We'd thank love you. to hear from you. Yes, thanks. Yeah. JR, thank you for all you do. Yeah. Truly thank amazing. You, <laughs> thank you. It's, it's fun to get to uh, work on the people in the practice uh, after you know selling technology for so many years and have these conversations. So yeah, thank you both for the perspectives. Uh, really looking forward to getting a copy of the recording and I yeah, hope you all engage you know, in the conversation in the foundation and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll see you all online soon. Thank you.